Now, there are other besides these neurotrophins, and I'll cite you an example from uh, my colleagues in, at the University of Calgary, the work of uh, Wee Yong and Sam Weiss, and what they noticed and they pursued is I mentioned these toxins that can cause the demyelination and that the animal recovers. What was noted is that, in fact, if you have pregnant animal, a pregnant mouse and induce damage the myelin, the myelin repairs more rapidly. And if that's so, what is, what are, what is going on? Is this hormonally related? And they pr published this paper with very strong evidence that the hormone prolactin may be in a very important molecule in stimulating myelin repair. <coughs> Should this go to the clinic? Well, you can be sure that the group at the University of Calgary is in deep discussions how you would do this and what are, are there any side effects. Uh, I noticed Peter's slide that says there's no free lunch and that there's some concern that prolactin at certain doses actually activates the immune system. So one is going to have to figure out a strategy, but again, listing uh, products and hormones and pharmacologic agents that have real names that the time has come for us to decide how do we proceed further. Now, again, we have to be realistic in this, that if you've destroyed much of the nervous system and the nerve fibers aren't there, putting the myelin in is not going to make the, the difference. And so whether we have to be very aggressive even from the outset to combine protection, repair, and anti-inflammation medicines, this is going to be uh, the challenge. Now here's another example of a uh, observation about remyelination. This is a slide given to me courtesy of uh, Arthur Warrington and Moses Rodriguez from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota in the U.S. And that what they have found actually from screening people who had a specific type of antibodies occurring as part of a disease, as part of uh, a myeloma type disease, uh, these are so-called IgM proteins, and they have found several of them that actually will stimulate remyelination, and they are very close to going to a clinical trial with these types of reagents to see whether they will stimulate repair in the human nervous system. Do they do it in a mouse? Yes. And so that we do wonderful things if you're a mouse. <laughs> And so, and although one jokes about this in some ways, the, thing, the translational aspect is how do we make sure things are safe? You know, this is really a risk-benefit decision process. And one of the, I must say, that the role that the MS societies around the world do by interacting with the research community, the pressure is on the research community not to stop at the most level, but to make the transition or translation into what can actually go into treating a serious human disease. Now, the last slide I want to um, or, or finish with is that, is there any evidence that current agents may have an effect on the remyelination process? And that even if they don't benefit remyelination, now we're going to have to think about whether could they even do harm to that process? And I've listed the current agents that, similar to the list that Peter had on his, showed you. Now, of these MAB medications, that very little, very little of it gets into the nervous system. Antibodies don't cross the nervous system particularly well. And also, uh, copaxone, glutyramer acetate, is said not to cross into the brain very well. So you would think, at first glance, that these cells, these medications are unlikely to affect the repair process. However, one has to remember that they change the properties of many of the immune cells, and those immune cells get to the brain. And is it possible that by changing the properties of the immune cells, and Peter mentioned this briefly, that those immune cells may start to put out molecules that actually may be useful for the repair process, or conversely, they may actually damage the nervous system. So that one of the possibilities, and this is an active area of research, 
especially with glutyrimer acetate, as to whether are we inducing any molecules that actually could have a benefit within the central nervous system. Now, the ground rules are going to change with some of the newer drugs that were mentioned, fingolimod or FTY720, and even the statin drugs that many people associate with cholesterol management that has been used and is under clinical trial for some forms of early MS because it has anti-inflammatory properties, these, cell, these medications get directly into the nervous system. And there's going to be considerable discussion at this Ectrams meeting amongst the clinical and research community as to what is the impact of these drugs which, like it or not, get to the central nervous system. And here's with the FTY. It acts through a specific system called the S1P system, and that depending on which of these receptors you activate, you can promote survival of cells, you can alter how these cells put out their processes, and so this family provides an opportunity, again, of a drug that gets to the nervous system, and now if we can understand how selective it is, can we take advantage of knowing how the biology works, either this drug or related drugs, to drive the repair system. And here's an example of the statins, and just to, this is work done by my graduate student, Veronica Miron, who will be at, this meet, at the Ectrams meeting. When we apply statin drugs to the progenitor cells, we get these processes grow out, the cells look like they're going to be much better able to take part in a repair process. The problem is if we keep feeding the statins to these cells, they eventually take back their processes. And we're going to have to understand the good and the bad, again, of using these kinds of agents. So what I've tried to indicate to you in this talk, in terms of new therapies and where we're going, that you've heard between myself and Peter Rickman, the issue of immunotherapies and controlling the immune response as it goes towards the blood-brain barrier and across. And then we have to understand the events in the central nervous system and that as we start to understand the processes, the mechanisms that control how the myelin is formed, what sustains it, and now we, the, with the identification of these progenitor cells, can we drive them to be more effective so they're not just sitting in the brain resting. It's time for them to stop resting and start working. Thanks very much.